All right, so now that we know that we can use the determination of the circulation to figure out the lift on an airfoil, let's go back and before we move forward, figure out a little bit more about how we classify airfoils and some of the key nomenclature that we're going to need. And this material and the material for next lecture is from Anderson 4.1 to 4.9. So just as a reminder, We've talked about this before. An airfoil is a 2D section of a wing. In the plane of the incoming velocity. So, we have an airfoil wing section and there's the infinity and if we have axes x y and z then here for example we'd be talking about the xz plane now there are two main branches to low speed airfoil theory First, there's thin airfoil theory. And we'll talk about this, do an introduction today, and go into detail on it next, next lecture. And then there's airfoils of arbitrary thickness. And for this, we need something called the vortex panel method. We'll talk a little bit about that two lectures from now. So let's do some nomenclature. Some of this we've discussed briefly before, but some of it's new. So there's a standard for describing airfoil geometry, and that is the NACA standard of airfoils. Now, NACA was the predecessor to NASA before anyone thought about exploring space. So let me draw a thick airfoil to make it easier to see the types of features that I want to illustrate here. Sharp trailing edge. Very nice in the edge. Okay. So there's the foremost point, there's the back point. So we could draw a camber line. Sorry chord line is what we talked about before, which is a line that goes through the leading edge and the trailing edge. Leading edge and trailing edge, which are the front and back points of the airfoil. And this is the chord line. So that this distance is the chord C. The height perpendicular to the chord is the thickness of the airfoil. And now starting at this leading edge and going to the trailing edge, 
if we draw a curve that's always halfway between the upper and the lower surface, that's what we call the camber line. Specifically, the mean camber line. The camber is this distance, which varies locally along the airfoil. So the mean camber line is the locus of points halfway between the upper and lower surfaces measured perpendicular to the camber line itself. The leading and trailing edges are the furthest forward and rearward points on the camber line. The chord line is a straight line that connects the leading and trailing edges. The chord is simply the length of the chord line. And the camber is the maximum distance, the, the total camber is the maximum distance between the chord and the mean camber lines perpendicular to the chord line, as I've drawn here. And the thickness is just the distance between the upper and lower surface perpendicular to the chord line, again, as drawn here. The leading edge is often circular. On a NACA airfoil, it's always circular. Many airfoils nowadays have elliptical leading edges, but we won't get into that in this course. The radius of the leading edge is usually something on the order of about 2% of the cord. And the shape of a NACA airfoil is generated by specifying the shape of the mean camber line and then wrapping a specified symmetrical thickness distribution around the mean camber line. So it's a mean camber line plus a thickness distribution. There are several series of these airfoils. There's the four digit series, which are the originals. So, example is the NACA 2412. Each digit means something. So, the first digit is the maximum camber. The second digit is the location of the maximum camber, and this is in units of one tenth of cord. And then the final two digits are the maximum thickness. And this is also in percent cord. So if we have zero camber, by definition then, the mean camber line equals the cord line, and we have a symmetric airfoil. And so this will be specified as a NACA 00XX type of airfoil. There's also the five digit series. So you might see something like the NACA 23012. And the six digit series. 
sorry, the six series, which confusingly also has five digits, but has a dash. And for a full explanation of the five and six digit uh, meaning, you can look it up in your textbook. And that's on page 319. It's important to realize that many modern aircraft don't use NACA airfoils. They use custom airfoils, which are closely guarded trade secrets. Now, let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of real airfoils. So, especially for these NACA airfoils, extensive wind tunnel testing has been conducted. So there's a very good knowledge of what the characteristics of these airfoils are. Um, so here we'll just discuss some of the typical characteristics. So I'll draw a couple of axes. If this axis, axis is the angle of attack and this axis is the lift coefficient per unit span, then the airfoil is going to do something like this. the value of CL max, the maximum lift coefficient. Here we have the angle of attack for zero lift. The slope of this linear portion of the curve, A sub zero, which is D, CL, D alpha. And we call this the lift slope. This sudden decrease in lift corresponds to stall due to flow separation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a few lectures from now. But this is the overall lift characteristic of a typical airfoil. You have a large region of linear response followed by a highly nonlinear response at stall. So CL max has an important role because this determines the lowest speed at which an air can fly, an airplane can fly. Which is called the stalling speed. We know that lift is proportional to the lift coefficient and proportional to velocity squared. So the maximum value of lift coefficient for a given required lift due to a given aircraft weight will mean the lowest required flying velocity. For a symmetric airfoil, the angle of attack at which the lift equals zero is zero. And most airfoils have what we call positive camber which means that the camera line uh, mostly lies above the cord line. And then the zero lift angle of attack will be negative. Typically, this is something like two to three degrees. And as we've mentioned, inviscid flow theory allows us to predict the lift coefficient 
without viscous effects. So we can predict the width slope and the zero lift angles attached. It does not allow us to reiterate prediction of drag. Or CL max, because since this is a result of separation, this is a viscous flow problem. It's also possible to get the moment coefficient. And typically, these values are given about the quarter chord point. C over 4 point. Now, for real airfoils, the lift slope is not a function of Reynolds number, but CL max is a function of Reynolds number. Again, this makes sense because it's a viscous effect. And the moment coefficient is also typically not a function of Reynolds number except at large angles of attack. So just to give you an idea of what a typical airflow characteristic might look like, this is figure 4.10 from your textbook and shows lift and moment data both predicted by equations we'll get later and experimentally measured for NACA 2412, which is a pretty typical airfoil. It has alpha for L equals zero, negative 2.1 degrees. CL max of about 1.6 and a stalling angle of attack of about 16 degrees. Now, the drag coefficient since we're talking about real airfoils right at the moment, typically has a, a bucket shape. In fact, people will refer to this as a drag bucket. So, usually, if you plot this against angle of attack, the drag coefficient will look something like this. But I just want to re-emphasize that we cannot predict this with inviscid tools. But as you can see from figure 4.10 from the book, we can do an awfully good job before stall of predicting the lift slope the zero lift angle of attack and the moment coefficient. Next time, we'll figure out how to predict these using potential flow theory.